everyone in these last days of Earth's history. This Truth Provided audio clip is dedicated to all those parents that feel it's perfectly okay to take their children to Harry Potter movies or give them Harry Potter paraphernalia. In Acts chapter 8, verse 9, we read that there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in that same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Simon the sorcerer was an evil man. He even tried to purchase the Holy Spirit, as the book of Acts declares later in that same chapter. The reason I am bringing up Simon the Sorcerer is because just recently we see the Vatican proclaiming its acceptance of Harry Potter and his evil sorceries through Monsignor Peter Fleetwood, a once member of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Culture. Later I will share with you a shocking connection between Simon the Sorcerer and the man the Roman Catholic Church calls their first pope, namely Simon Peter. Zenit Organization, a mainstream Catholic publication located at zenit.org, released this article just the other day. Headline, In Defense of Harry Potter. Subheadline reads, Professor Defends Fiction's Famous Wizard. St. Paul, Minnesota, March 16, 2003. Zenit Organization. Monsignor Peter Fleetwood made headlines around the world when he appeared to give the Vatican's official blessing to the Harry Potter series. At a news conference February 3rd on a Vatican document on New Age, he was asked about the fictional adolescent wizard. Monsignor Fleetwood, who helped draft the New Age document when he was a member of the Pontifical Council for Culture, responded, Harry Potter does not represent a problem. Doesn't represent a problem? Harry Potter stories are jam-packed with witchcraft, sorcery, black magic, white magic, and other evil activities. It appears to me that the Vatican has got off the deep end here. Sad thing here is, this isn't the first time Harry Potter has been accepted by Rome. From the Roman Catholic Journal titled First Things, they reported back in January of 2000 that Ellen Jacobs of Wheaton College described the novels as a great deal of fun, their magic as charming, and added, there is in books like this the possibility for serious moral reflection. The problem I see is that most loyal Catholics are once again ignoring the obvious. What will it take to open the eyes of the children of God trapped in this church? Seriously, look at what all of us have seen recently. In March of 2000, for example, Pope John Paul II admitted to the world that the Roman Catholic Church was solely responsible for killing over 100 million Christians during the Dark Ages. Did this cause a massive exodus from the pews of the church? No. Then documentation is released regarding the fact that Roman Catholic priests are dying of AIDS, 11 times greater than any other group in the USA. But does that get the pews emptied in that church? Not yet. Then we see the Vatican condoning child molestation in the way that allowed certain activities to continue for decades. Thousands, and probably tens of thousands, have been molested by these pedophiliacs posing as Christians. And still, the pews remain filled. Then you would think the ultimate sin was committed by the Vatican when it openly proclaimed that Jesus Christ is not needed to gain heaven. They did it on three separate occasions in the last few years. March 20th, 1999, Cardinal Francis Arin said it. December 8th, 2000, Pope John Paul II himself said it. And then on August 12th, year 2002, by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, when they proclaimed all Catholics need not evangelize Jews. They're guaranteed heaven without accepting Jesus, they said. Pray for your Catholic loved ones. They are being attacked in such a way that teaches them to accept such evils as the norm in Christianity. Is it any wonder we hear Monsignor Peter Fleetwood, a once member of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Culture, declaring Harry Potter is an accepted pastime for the children of the world? In fact, it is recorded in the Harry Potter article that Fleetwood announced the author of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling, displayed a Christian manner of writing. This priest not only condones the Harry Potter evils, he is now making them appear Christ-like pro by proclaiming the author writes in a Christ-like manner. But this will, of course, cause even more Catholics, and many that trust the Catholic Church, to feel no remorse whatsoever when seeking these evil books for their children. Did his evil plan work? Well, over 40 million copies of the Harry Potter books have been printed so far. You can find these books in over 40 languages in 130 different countries now. That quick. Over a million audio versions of the book have been sold as well. Scholastic, the U.S. publisher of the books, has netted over $200 million in profits from the sale of Satanism to the children of this world so far. And the author, J.K. Rowling, is now considered the richest woman in Britain. Plus, she is actually the very first billionaire in history to obtain her fortune by writing books. Is she a witch? You tell me. 
It appears her satanic spell has been cast, and the world has been bewitched into buying her books and everything attached to them with glee. Los Angeles Times, October 22nd, reported it's mind-boggling. It would be easy to attribute Harry Potter's success to some form of magical intervention, says Joan Fywell, scholastic representative. Diane Robeck, children's book editor, is quoted in USA Today that Harry that the Harry Potter phenomenon is unprecedented in children's literature. A recent Gallup poll found that almost one-third of all parents with kids under 18 have children who have read a Harry Potter book. That's from Breakpoint, July 14, 2000. Chuck Colson also stated back in 1999 that fantasy tales are harmless and Rowling's book characters demonstrate courage, loyalty, and a willingness to sacrifice for one another. Not bad lessons in a self-centered world. November 1, 1999, he stated that. So yes, it appears witchcraft is indeed at play here. Not only the infamous Vatican is stating their approval of this witch and her satanic tales, Chuck Colson of Breakpoint is also throwing his acceptance into the mix. I wonder, is this desire to join the ranks of the Vatican spreading? Well, from Christianity Today, in an article entitled Why We Like Harry Potter, dated January 10, 2000, they state, Rowling's series is a book of virtues with a pre-adolescent funny bone. Amid the laugh-out-loud scenes are wonderful examples of compassion, loyalty, courage, friendship, and even uh, self-sacrifice. No wonder young readers want to be like these believable characters. That is a Christmas present we can be grateful for. Rather ironic how they mention the pagan festival of Christmas with the paganism of witchcraft and Harry Potter all in one breath, I think. Ken McCormick stated in the Baptist Press on July 13, 2000, There is a general nastiness underneath the mantle of cuteness. The kids lie, they steal, they take revenge. This is a disturbing moral world, and it conflicts with what I am trying to teach my children. Well, amen, Mr. McCormick, amen. In these books, we see a bevy of evil activities being suggested. For example, in the books you will find bad conduct is rewarded, foul language is used, acts of hatred and revenge are frequent, graphic nightmarish scenes run throughout it, demons take control of people, Murders are frequent occurrences as well. Reincarnation is taught throughout the stories. Demonic creatures and disembodied spirits are the norm. Authentic symbols and objects of Satanism and witchcraft are all over these stories. Infamous spiritualists and false gods of past human cultures are the names for the characters in these books. The satanic art of black magic is portrayed as something all children should aspire to attain. Fortune-telling, crystal balls, and hypnosis are emphasized as a method of higher learning, and each new book is worse than the last. And now, J.K. Rowling is planning on introducing an erotic ghost for Harry in her next book. Rowling states in a Conlin interview back in September of 1999 that Harry's going to have quite a bit to deal with as he gets older. Harry and his friends will be discovering their hormones as they grow older. Rowling actually suggests that in book four, Harry sees a number of sensual, erotic ghost women, the most beautiful women Harry has ever seen as she puts it in the book, Goblet of Fire, on page 103. Does J.K. Rowling show signs of openly allowing demonic influence to direct her work? In Reuters, July 17, 2000, Rowling stated that the character of Harry just strolled into my mind. I really did feel he was someone who walked up and introduced himself to my mind's eye. When you look at the demonic activities that are literally on every page of these books, it doesn't take much to guess who it was that strolled into Rowling's mind that day. If you get time, I suggest you investigate the life of J.K. Rowling. You will find that she was fascinated and studied witchcraft at a very early age. Her childhood friends have been documented stating she would frequently dress up as a witch when she was young. Ian Potter and Vicki Potter, quoted in the Danielle Dimitri's book, Harry Potter and the Source of Inspiration, this is from uh, uh, Electronic Telegraph, July 1st, 2000, stated the following. Our favorite thing was to dress up as witches. We used to dress up and play witch all the time. My brother would dress up as a wizard. Joanne was always reading witchcraft stories to us. We would make certain potions for her. She would always send us off to get twigs for the potions. That's right. Her childhood friends had the last name of Potter. Joanne Rowling claims to know little about witchcraft. However, her books graphically declare she's a bold-faced liar, which, by the way, is a prerequisite to being a witch. Rowling states in an interview back in 1999 that I truly am bemused that anyone who has read these books would think that I am a proponent of the occult in any serious way. I don't believe in witchcraft in the sense that they are talking about it all. I don't believe in magic in the way that I describe it in my books. 
This is from an article entitled Success Stuns Harry Potter Author from the Associated Press, July 6, 2000. However, in October, the year before, she states in this article, I do a certain amount of research and folklore is quite important in books. So where I'm mentioning a creature or a spell that people used to believe genuinely would work, of course it didn't, then I will find out exactly what the words were, and I will find out exactly what the characteristics of that creature or ghost were supposed to be. Much of sorcery material in the books are things that people genuinely used to believe in Britain. That's from JKR's interview on National Public Radio, October 20th, 1999. Rowling also stated in November of 1999, I'm not trying to influence anyone into black magic. That's the very last thing I want to do. My wizarding world is a world of imagination. I think it's a moral world. Quoted in USA Week and online November 14, 1999. If it's all just a world of imagination, then why is she researching authentic satanic incantations? Why is she so adamant about making sure the proper words are used in these spells? And why does she seek which demons were to be conjured up? Forty million households so far have these satanically saturated books in their homes, and the Vatican is making these books seem all the more appealing for even more to be caught up in the Harry Potter spell by condoning such satanic activity. Could it be the Vatican approves of sorcery a lot more than they let on? Well, the truth about that has to do with the shocker I hinted of earlier that is connected with Simon the Sorcerer from the Book of Acts, Chapter 8. On my website, I have a page entitled, The Actual First Pope. In it is well-documented historical facts regarding what became of this Simon from Acts, Chapter 8. On that page is also documented proof that the pagans of old used to call their high priests Pators, or Petors. If the sorcerer's name was George, for example, he would be called George Pator or George Petor to signify him as a high priest in the pagan temple. Simon of Acts chapter 8 was a sorcerer and a high priest. Therefore, he would be called Simon Peter. In fact, this is the Simon Peter that actually resided in Rome and the very same Simon Peter that was honored by Caesar in stone as a god. Fact is, folks, there is now documented proof that the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church was the very same Simon that tried to purchase the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8. Now you know how it's possible for a Simon Peter to be in Rome when the Bible declares the Apostle Peter never started a church in Rome. In fact, we are told by Paul himself that it was he, not Peter, who was going to officially found the Roman Church. Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Another fact is Paul openly informs us in the word of God that Peter was not in Rome in 65 AD. This is regardless of the fact that the Roman Catholic Church says he was. Paul said, only Luke is with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. The truth is, Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. It is recorded he was actually in Rome. Plus, he wrote at least six epistles while in Rome. Nevertheless, not only does he never mention Peter being in Rome with him or even before him, but at the last moment, he boldly says, only Luke is with me. Biblically, documented fact remains. Peter never started a church in Rome. Documented historic fact reveals it was Simon the sorcerer that started the Roman Catholic Church. And that is why the Vatican lends its approval to the young sorcerer called Harry Potter. This is Nicholas from Presence of God Ministries saying, Until next time, I pray the Lord blesses you and yours with a desire to be the Christian he created you to be. Thank you for listening, and remember, the truth is provided in the Word of God.